So I'm Sarah Willardson. I'm an adult services librarian at Prescott Public Library. I want to welcome you to the first installment of this two-part workshop, ser workshop series on seed saving. The second workshop is going to take place next week on Saturday, October 23rd at 3 p.m. If you haven't registered for that yet, please visit our online calendar to register so you don't miss out on it. For the workshop today, there's going to be three sections. After each section, you have a question and answer session. You're also welcome to write your questions in the chat area of this Zoom meeting as the program progresses. Um, as I said before, please keep your microphones muted during the program unless you're speaking with a question or whatever. And finally, I want to thank the friends of Prescott Public Library who provide funding for programs like this one and help provide funding for things like the Seed Library as a whole. Our presenter today is a seed saver, writer, and educator based in Cornville, Arizona. He is co-founder of the Down Home Project, Garden City Seeds, Seeds Trust, High Altitude Gardens, the Sawtooth Botanical Gardens, Seed School, and the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. He is the author of the book, Basic Seed Saving, and is the former executive director of Native Seeds, Search, and Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. He now oversees the patent-free seed campaign and teaches the seed school whenever he is called. Please join me in welcoming Bill McDorman. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you to Prescott for uh, sponsoring this. Thank you, Molly Beverly, for always being an initiator for this sort of thing. And uh, this, I think, is our fourth um, seed school we've done in Prescott. The others before COVID were live, and I uh, and I look forward to the day when we can do that again. There's lots of hands-on things we can do, and it helps build community. And so. Um, <clears throat> All those things that she just read about me, I did for one reason, and that's um, to teach people how to save more seeds. And so this is really my passion and what I love to do. I've been doing this since 1979, I think, in a way. Um, um, in addition to what she said, I'm a white privileged male uh, trying to make my way in the 20, early 21st century in the land of the Sanawa. Um, I'm trying to learn how to be humble and to be a good human being here. And I'm, I have to tell you, it's hard. I don't know quite how to be in this modern world in, in a lot of ways. I'm re-questioning a lot of things. And so I'm really happy that you're all here today, though, um, because um, I, and I hope we have fun. And my goal is for you to actually become operational. We've actually had students come to our seed schools that weren't even gardeners that ended up owning seed companies. And so I think that this topic deserves that kind of attention and follow through. And so uh, my job today is to pass that on to you. So without further ado, I'm gonna get into some PowerPoint. Um, uh, you will get access to this PowerPoint and there's lots of links on the bottom for the things that I'm saying. I'm not gonna have time today since I'm cramming a six day course into two hours. Um, to really explain, you know, all the references and to, uh, to make the cases um, if you have questions about what I'm saying, but you will have links and you will be able to uh, check out things on your own and then we'll be here next week if you have other questions for me to, to try to uh, follow through with and, uh, and get your thing answered. So I'm going to share my screen. We, uh, we just tried this um, a few minutes ago. And it worked out for me. Let me see if I can get um, get it to work. Okay. Okay. Does that look okay, Sarah? I and Renee, you got the double slides again. Oh, I got the double. Okay, let me um, let me see if I can't get back out of this. Then here, hold. Stop the share, stop the show. Okay. Let me try it this way. 
this way. Bingo. That looks good. Yeah, you're good. All right. So there's a lot of different things to say about why um, people should um, get into seed saving. And um, but the reason I got involved in 1979 and the reason why I'm still involved today, but much to my surprise sometimes, is that uh, is the loss of diversity. It's just a basic biological fact that the more diversity you have for any biological system, the um, stronger it's going to be. And our uh, agricultural food system has uh, been greatly weakened. And you can argue back and forth how many varieties we've lost. I know Seed the Untold Story said that like 78% or something, there's different numbers that come. I sort of side with Colin Curry, who was working at the National Seed Storage Laboratory when he said, you know, it's really hard to count what we lost, you know? And so if you dig deep into that stuff, it really is hard to figure out how much diversity we've lost. So I fall back on, um, on these statistics that came out of the Food and Agriculture Organization in the United Nations that really tried hard to study. And they just counted what was growing in fields. And more than 90% of the diversity that we've uh, had growing in our fields disappeared in two generations. And at a time when we have um, uh, this coming, this is a picture of the Greek island, one of the largest Greek islands off the coast of Athens last summer, when the whole island burned. They had to evacuate the whole island. And they largely believed this was due to the hottest summer and the driest conditions over the period of time brought on by climate change. And now I just read a couple of days ago in the paper, they're evacuating the island again because the rains are coming. And there's no, no plant life left to hold the soil. And so now they're afraid of mudslides and, and floods. And so um, at a time when we need diversity more than ever to help weather the storms that are coming, and I think some of those are gonna be political like we've seen during COVID. Um, we need to figure out a little bit better, you know, how to uh, get our own food and how to make the system that makes our food stronger. And so, I mean, when, you know, 30% of the world's um, uh, uh, container traffic can be held up for six days by one ship, you know, going sideways in the Suez Canal, um, that was the wake up call. And you read this even in the business news that, um, you know, shorten your supply lines, find out how to get what you need closer to home. Every nation's talking about that, and especially about food. And so that's part of what we're going to talk about. And when we talk about diversity, lots of times I'll get questions like, don't we have enough diversity? Don't we have a bunch of seed banks that, that have all these things, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of varieties being stored? And there's a graphic of the taller the line, the more uh, accessions, they call them, the more different varieties of seeds they have in those banks. And you can see in Fort Collins, Colorado is our largest, the National Seed Storage Laboratory. And these are generally organized by an organization known as SEGAR, which was started by the Rock. Feller Foundation um, and the United Nations that sort of runs this system. And uh, there's a lot of stuff in, in seed banks. And this started in the 70s when, when people figured out that because of industrial agriculture and because of the way we were building our modern world, we were losing all this diversity. We drove millions of farmers off the land. And as um, seed companies got larger, they just threw away all the old varieties that they couldn't sell very many of. And so we're left with just a handful of, of hybrid varieties, basically monocropping the whole planet. Um, this is Svalbard, you know, the Doomsday Seed Vault, which is basically a backup for all of the Seagar um, uh, seed uh, banks. So this one doesn't actually try to grow out or take care of varieties. This is just, you know, Doomsday Safety Backup. And um, it's run by the Global Crop Diversity Trust. And they're in the, they're right now trying to do a fundraiser. They're trying to raise about $850 million in, a tr in their trust so that they can keep the lights on in all of those seed banks, the Seagar seed banks. And they're trying to raise $850 million to keep the lights on. Nobody has the money to take all those millions of accessions out, the 7.4 million accessions, the seeds they've saved because of the loss of diversity. Nobody, 
um, has the money to grow those back out again, and they're starting to die. We're talking since the 70s of 50 or 60 years, and that's the lifespan of some seeds. And so um, if you add up what it would cost, it's like $4.6 billion. And governments don't want to fund this anymore. Our vice president recently is going to run for president, doesn't believe in evolution. I mean, how do you get funding from your government for a seed bank if your officials don't believe in evolution? And so, so nobody's coming to save us. That's my, um, my conclusion on a global level for the diversity that humanity needs. And having been the director of a $1.2 million a year budget seed conservation center, Native Seed Search in Tucson, I can tell you nobody wants to fund it there either. They're just trying to take care of 2000 accessions. And so it took me a number of years to come around to this, but I wholly embrace this. And this is one of the major things I want you to understand today is that if we are going to survive with our food system, with the coming storms, we need our own diversity, okay? We need lots of it right where we are. And biologically, this has to be grassroots. You get millions of people growing and saving their own seeds, that will entrench, adapt, and create diversity everywhere. That's what we used to have. Two generations ago, every farmer and gardener saved their own seeds. And each one of the, those generations of saving them changed those varieties a little bit and adapted them to where they were. And that's how we got all the diversity that we squandered in this last couple of generations. And so just remember this, nobody's coming to save us. No institution has the money. Nobody could design a program to save the diversity that it took humanity 10,000 years to create in every little nook and cranny all over the country, in areas like Prescott that are outside the mainstream. Nobody's ever gonna breed varieties of anything for Prescott. It's just too small of a market. We have huge giant corporate seed companies now. And so if we want our own things, we're gonna to have to do it, okay? Fortunately, that's easy and fun. Um, and if you wanna get involved, this I, uh, we started a program called the Million um, Seed Savers. And this was in response to the Millions Against Monsanto March they had a few years ago where millions of people actually worldwide um, marched uh, uh, against Monsanto and its practices of centralizing and GMOs. And so personally, next time we march, I wanna march for something. We're gonna march a million seed savers. And if we could do that, say in our lifetimes, and there's, you know, it's one of those big audacious goals, but it keeps growing every year. I got a feeling it's gonna be like a hockey stick and all of a sudden one day it's gonna happen. But you can sign up and be on the list and we'll let you know when the march is. So this week, this past week, and, and actually in the last month or so, the whole world's been a buzz about the United Nations Food System sub Summit. And that's because um, uh, this is the world's way of saying, we've got to figure out how our fragile food system is going to make it through all these storms. And so, um, you know, the basic message coming through this, unfortunately, still is that we need industrial agriculture to feed the 10 billion people we're going to soon have on the planet. That, and um, the meeting was basically hijacked, is what um, 5,000 smallholder farmer organizations around the world have concluded, and they walked out. They're not even going to be part of it anymore. The whole agenda was around corporate food and industrial food um, uh, strategies. And so, um, you know, the, the little people of the world have cell phones now, and they're getting organized, and they have their own websites, and they just, and they're conscious, and they realize that, that if they're going to survive, they're going to need the same thing we need, our own varieties of seeds that work right where we are. You know, and I took this off of The Guardian just the other day, September 20th, you know, um, talking about the effects of the industrial food system that's being questioned everywhere. And the ETC group in Canada has done some really great work about this. This is a, a, an essay you can download PDF. And it starts to break through some of the myths that I think that we were brought up with, that in, industrial ag does account for more than 80% of the fossil fuel emissions in some countries, and it uses over 70% of the water for agriculture. And yet it only produces 30% of the world's food. They, we think that industrial agriculture is this whole big monocrop for the whole planet, and yet that's not quite true. Why? Because uh, over one third of the 
and this is when we had 7.3 billion people. This is, we streamed by that. But one third of the people on the planet are farmers and they produce nearly 70% of the food, small holder farmers. We're still the ones that do that. And we want our own seeds to be able to do that. And farms smaller than two hectares account for 84% of all farms. And more than 90% of the farms worldwide are managed by families. Lots of them small, single families. And so we've got all this sort of stuff on our, on our radar and um, we just need to recognize it as being important, not only for the food it produces, but for the diversity it keeps in place and keeps producing. They're sort of outside this industrial system, a lot of it. And yet the United Nations wants to bring that industrial system into those areas still. So and more good news, you know, we could eat locally, even in this country. Those little red circles are the cities where there's more people than you could um, gr probably grow enough food for within 100 miles. But that's relatively small amount of the United States. And you could see in Arizona, we could do it. Um, and urban farms now, up to 20% of the world's food. It's a picture of my good friend Benjamin Farr's um, new office building in Oakland, California. This is the roof of the office building. And so he grows salad greens and takes them downstairs and they sell them at the restaurants there in Oakland. And we're starting to see more and more of these sorts of things. And, you know, so don't we already have a local food system going? I mean, isn't that what we need to do? This is off the local first um, AZ website, the Good Food Finder. This is a new directory they have up. And you can see all the people that are producing local food now. We know that if Arizonans, um, it's Southern Arizonans, and that includes Prescott, if we uh, shifted $5 a week more in our food buying habits, that's every family or every food buyer in Arizona, we could shift $300 million a year back into the Arizona economy. And that's just $5 worth. Right now, 96% of the food grown in Arizona leaves, and about 98% of the food that we eat in Arizona is shipped in from somewhere else. I mean, you have to go to fourth world countries to find that sort of differential. And I think that's why so many of our communities are so poor. Well, we know it is. We can build economic strength as well by, while we're building this local food system. But the problem with our local food system is that there are no seeds for it. Almost none of the seeds being used in local agriculture in Arizona uh, come from Arizona. They come from thousands of miles away. This is a map, a rather famous one. Uh, those red circles are chemical companies, and those are all the seed companies they've purchased since 1976, 1996, excuse me. And then, you know, with COVID, we ran into this this year. You know, Johnny Selected Seed, the largest organic seed seller in the United States. We are sorry. We can't ship to regular gardeners this year. And our uh, orders to our commercial farmers are going to be delayed. Um, rumors are that 50 to 60% of Johnny's seeds, the uh, certified organic ones are grown, contract grown now in China. And they had trouble with their shipment here. So we're building this great local uh, um, food um, system, you know, because we we're smart people. We want resilience. We want sustainability. We're going to make it together. And we don't have any seeds. And they're all coming from China even. And we're, the the further thing about our local food movement is that um, this is a United Nations slide for food worldwide, but it applies. Um, most of what we eat is grain. If you take into account that dairy and eggs and the meat part of these circles are also produced because of grain that's fed to the animals, about 60% of our food is um, directly re uh, related to the production of grains. And so we've got a great local food movement. And as my uh, young farm manager at Native Seeds said to me one time, he said, Bill, you know, it's great, all the local food, but that's, you know, the icing on the cake. We need the cake. We need the greens. And so I've been part of a, a couple of um, uh, grants and systems. We've got Hayden Mills is up and running again, growing local grains, uh, BKW Farms in Tucson. Actually, Arizona's ahead in this, but we've got a long ways to go. And so right now we're doing a grain school at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And um, we're into our third week, but there's still, if you wanna join, you could all the, those classes are being recorded and you could catch up if you wanna learn the grain part of it. And it's really exciting. And I'll talk more about that later. 
So, you know, that just raises the question, why don't we save our own seeds? It's like, duh, we want, we, we want more diversity so we can survive. We need a local food movement to do that. And we don't have any seeds. So what's stopping us? Well, most of us come into this, we just think it's too difficult. This is Susan Ashworth's great book that's been out for about 20 years, Seed to Seed. And you open up the table of contents and it's Latin. I mean, and most people go, what? I don't, you know, I don't want to learn Latin. I just want to save some seeds. I mean, it, it's, it looks like a really difficult and complicated topic when you first get into it, you know? And most people come away thinking, oh my God, I'm not good enough to, to, to do my own seeds, you know? But we've got this cult of expertise. We need universities. We need, we need big corporations to do this. Oh my God, there may be inbred depression. Oh, those varieties may not breed true. All those sorts of things have come out of this sort of cult of expertise. And, and my seeds will never be as good. No matter what I do, I'll never have seeds that are as good. Well, I don't have time to explain all of why that's wrong, but Dan Barber of Stone Barn, who has been in the, even the New York Times with, with essays and articles lately, famous chef, James Beard chef, um, couldn't find varieties of squash good enough for him at Stone Barn in New York. So they started their own seed company um, to start to save their own seeds and adapt their own squash. They taste every single one that comes out and only save the seeds from the ones that taste good. And so even they have seen through those myths and are starting their own seed company. And I wrote a book in 1992 to sort of demystify this and get people in at the easiest level. This is not a dark, scary forest. There are breadcrumbs. You can come in. And so hopefully today you'll get some of those crumbs. And this book's available on the RockyMountainSeed.org um, website. So one of the myths that you run into right away, most American gardeners, um, you can't save seeds from hybrids. And there's could be nothing further from the truth. In fact, we should probably be saving seeds from hybrids because of the hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone into disease resistance in many of the varieties of things that are out there. And we could reclaim those, dehybridize them, make them open pollinated varieties again. I'll explain that in a minute and have our own seeds and save them in our own community, put them in our own seed libraries again. So, and this is just an example of uh, one article that I read about it, where a guy got so into this, he says, oh yeah, let's dehybridize everything. And people go, is that legal? Well, of course it's legal. There are seeds that are patented where it is illegal to save your own seeds now. And that's, but those are very few and far between. There's more than I'd like to see, but, and that's coming. And we'll talk about that next week. But um, if it's just a hybrid, you can just dehybridize it. It'll take more than a year, it might take three years to get a working crop, it may take eight years to make it more true or pure, but we can do that with everything. And see, you know, if you go to a farmer's markets and ask the farmers where they get their seeds, and I've done this with farmer's markets all over the Rocky Mountain West as director of Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, they all have the same answer. Almost every farmer who actually grows food has the same answer. They say, um, uh, Johnny's, selected seeds. That's where we go. We get some from high mowing, some from territorial, but they're the only ones geared up, professional, get me my seeds. This is the place, right? And so, you know, it's not worth my time to save my own seeds if I'm a market farmer. Well, Nash Huber said that clear up until his favorite carrot disappeared from the Johnny's catalog. And he's going, oh my God, rumba's gone. This is my carrot. So he dug through, found some old seeds from a year past, got together with uh, John Navazio, a great plant breeder, who's actually a breeder at Johnny's now, and um, started growing out and saving their own seeds. Um, and adapting it to where Nash was in his fields. And a few years later, it's Nash Huber's carrots are for sale at the Seattle farmer's market. It's the hit. So Nash doesn't have to compete against other farmers now to sell carrots because he doesn't sell carrots anymore. He sells Nash Huber's carrots. More than that, he's selling the seed. He's got another profit center. So if you ever think that it's not worth your time, you're just missing maybe the greatest opportunity you have as a market farmer um, by getting back into the seed business. And of course, everybody says, oh, I might make a mistake. <gasps> oh no, well, what's the worst thing that can happen if you make a genetic mistake in your home garden? This is Dr. Carol Depe from Harvard University said this. What's the worst thing that happens? You get to eat it. 
you still get to eat, you're still gardening. Seed saving is all on top of that. We're not asking you to do anything different, garden, right? But if you make a mistake, maybe you'll get a pumpsini that you like. This is from my good friend, Greg Bat, Bat sent me this picture in Utah. He was so excited after going to seed school. He goes, Bill, Bill, I finally got a pumpsini, which was an unwanted cross between his pumpkins and his zucchinis. And he loves it, right? And then I was just looking on the internet, kale sprouts. This was an unwanted cross between kale and Brussels sprouts. I mean, horrifying mistake genetically, right? But look, whoa, maybe we'll get something new and adventurous and exciting out of it. And that's the kind of excitement we want to impart to you as new seed savers. This isn't dark and scary. This is the most exciting thing you've ever done. So I'm going to, uh, let me just check my time here a little bit. Yeah, looking good, Bill. Yeah. Did anybody have questions for Bill? I didn't see any in the chat. Yeah, let's do questions. This is good. I don't hear anybody. I don't hear anybody. From recognizing this was the start of part two. Bill, have you ever tried a kale sprout? I have. What, what does it taste like? Oh, just like kale. They're like little kaleettes, you know, and um, a friend of mine in Montana bred uh, cabbage sprouts. So he would get like about uh, six softball sized cabbages up the side of his Brussels sprout. And they were great. It was like, they were like little, you know, uh, just um, right for dinner for two, you know, cabbages. And he would just cut one off and they would stay, you know, there, it was great. And so, you know, this idea that we have to keep things in their lanes because that's what was given to us, right? And especially this idea comes in our seed libraries, right? People go, well, you know, the people that save seeds that return them to seed libraries don't know what they're doing, right? So I might not get what I want. You know, what, who cares? Get whatever is happening because it is adapted. If people save seeds from something that they grew in your area, near your library, that's a plus. That adaptation we know now can be passed on in one year to your plants. They can react. That's why volunteers work so well. Every gardener knows that the volunteers in their garden are usually the best plants. That's because they're thinking it through. They're adapting. They're doing a million changes genetically, epigenetically, if you will, in a season. And they pass that on to their offspring. And so, yeah, let's just have a big adventure here, you know. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So could you also speak a little bit about how to actually dehybridize a seed? Or are we going to go into that a little bit later? I am. That's coming up next. You can okay. see hybrid F1 on the slide there. And I'll talk about it. All right. Sweet. Yeah. And um, if I don't have it in this show, I'll, I'll do it next time. Basically, all you have to do, and I'll just tell you, it's none of this stuff's hard save seeds from what you like. So if you plant a hybrid and you, and you love your hybrid and you save seeds from that and you plant those, that's what they call the F2 generation. This is like the grandchildren of the original hybrid parents. And you don't know what those parents look like. You just had their offspring, the hybrid, right? And so you're saving seeds from those and planting them. You're getting the grandkids. And it's like all grandkids. They could have red hair when neither one of the parents had red hair right? They could come up with characteristics that were, were hidden in the parents that you've never seen before. That's all that can happen. And so people go, oh, well, it's not like my cabbage. I saved the seeds and I want the hybrid cabbage that I had. Well, look through um, your row and find the one that looks most like the ones you like and save seeds from that one. That's all you have to do. Every year, just save seeds from what you want from what you like, what, what you're trying to create, what, what tastes good, as Joseph Lofthaus would say. And after three generations, you'll probably have a working. They won't all look like that, like you want. But after eight generations, they'll probably all look like your original hybrid cabbage. And you can do this with everything. So it's really a fun, um, fun adventure. I call it Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. One year I did that with a hybrid pepper and I got a big white football, literally 
a pepper that looked like a football that was white. That was about this big. And on the other end of the spectrum, I got, um, it looked like a chiltopine, a little red hot pepper and everything in between, every color of the rainbow. I don't know what was in the parents of gypsy hybrid pepper, but uh, it was wild. And it was so, it, it's almost debilitating because you want to save seeds from them all. Oh, I like the orange one. I like the white one. I like the little hot ones. You, I don't have enough time in the, for the rest of my life to grow those all out and save them. You know, you can go down a rabbit hole quickly, you know, so be ready for a great adventure and fun. And you can do this with anything. And so now the, our great adventure, I'll just fast forward you to the future. And what we're doing is we're taking a hybrid and mixing it in with several other open pollinators and creating a Grex, letting it all mix up and then saving what we want out of that. And that's like high adventure. And that's actually the quickest way to get to plants that will be most adapted to your conditions, whatever the soil is, the water, you know, I'm giving up pampering things. If it can't make it in my yard, it can't make it. I want stuff that makes it. So I'm just going to keep bringing in all this diversity, keep mixing it up and just save from what I want. All right. Um, Bill. Yeah. They're talking about undoing a hybridized plant. I tried that last year. I had a squash that I liked the previous year and, and grew up two of them to, you know, the extreme, dried them, collected the seeds, dried them again, planted them. They didn't produce any, it was a squash, a, a simple yellow squash and it was hybridized when I bought the seeds. It never produced anything that I could collect seeds from. What is your thought on what would cause that? Because to me, um, it looked like all male flowers. So I'm, I'm not quite sure how that happened or why it happened. You know, I, there's a lot of whys. So the one thing that, if, uh, that will help is to grow more of them. What you're doing is rolling dice. You've got all sorts of, maybe there's some sterility in one of the parents. I, you know, I haven't heard of that in squash, but um, so um, in the F2 generation, if you can grow out a hundred of them. Oh God, I don't have the room so, for yeah, that. So immediately a home gardener goes, I can't do that. Well, you can grow a few of them every year and then you could pull those seeds. You just keep trying. And that's where a seed library or a community come in. You can pass them out at a seed exchange and say, hey, I'm doing this really great experiment. Here's my F2 squash seeds. Can you guys grow them out and see if you get anything? And you can get a hundred squash plants growing in and around your community um, with people and they don't all have to be in your yard or they don't even all have to be that year. So that would be one strategy. That's a good thought. If you'll start with um, uh, more um, self-pollinating plants first, you know, like tomatoes and peppers and lettuce, right, right. Um, you will get more usable stuff faster. Okay. Yeah, I'm working so, with, with Molly on that Prescott tomato plant. Right. Um, I've, you know, it's been a project for her last year and I, and I save seeds this year. So I'm definitely going to try to grow those out, which is my first attempt at growing something from a tomato seed plant that I collected myself. Yes. So it's, it's another project. Don't, can't you wait to have a dinner party and somebody oh, I'd love it. bites into one of your tomatoes and they go, where did you get this tomato? And you go, oh, it's mine. They go, what do you mean it's yours? You grew it and you go, yeah. Well, where did you get the seeds? They go, they're mine. <laughs> I mean, if you want street cred as a gardener, that's it. That's why everybody just stops. It takes their breath away. And that, you know, and that's easy. All you have to do is save seeds. It's really fun. All right, thanks. All right, so I'm gonna do some basic terms to help you here. I think all of this will help you a little bit. Let me get my other thing going here. Okay, <clears throat> variety names. I'm just wanna do the proper name for a plant. So you can kind of see how this fits botanically into the, the world. Variety names are below species. All right, so there's the full name for Sasha's Altai, one of my favorites, tomatoes. The kingdom, you know, you could go all the way down. Usually, you know, the binomical um, system, you just say Solanum, like Caspersicum, um, 
Sasha's all done. All right. And I'm bringing this up for a really good reason, because as you come down that tree, um, the only real things you need to pay attention to are the families as a seed saver. Pay special attention to the family and the species. I want you to learn the family, genus and species of everything you're saving. Why? Because that will help you shortcut the whole system. Generally, families all have the same breeding system. They do. There are differences in genera, but generally, if you figure out how to save seeds in one family, one uh, member of the family, one species or one genera, then you can easily save the seeds successfully in the others, right? So just learn what your family is, and then you can spread yourself out quickly into other plants. This is a way to hack into it. And then the other thing is you want to learn the species name because that's the definition of a species. Species aren't supposed to cross. Okay, so you can grow two different species right next to each other with little um, uh, fear that they will cross and cause something to happen you don't want to happen. I personally have, I, I'm at the age now where I want everything to cross anyway. But if you don't want that to happen, this is how you pay attention to that and how you get it to work. Now, never say never. We call that a wide or a wild cross when it happens in between species. But generally that's the case and that'll just save you lots of time. And if you wanna short circuit your, your adventure into botany, this is the book. This is basically a, a wiki um, web um, uh, crowdsourced botany manual. This guy's been putting this up on the web and taking suggestions from people around the world for years now and then improving it with each new edition. And so it's really, it's how you get in and learn a little botany most quickly if you really want to understand the relationships between plants. And I highly recommend it. Okay, other than that, you know, there are three um, breeding system questions you should ask whenever you want to start to save something new. Um, these are breeding system terms, okay? That's a picture of John Jevons, one of my heroes that wrote a really great book years and years ago. Um, is it open pollinated or hybrid? That, that'll just help um, uh, take some frustration out of your life as you go down and you start saving seeds. It'll help you get used to what to expect. Um, are the flowers perfect or imperfect? And is the, is the, the plant itself a selfer or a crosser? Does it self-pollinate or does it need pollination from somewhere else? And if you learn those things, and you can't really see those things on a plant if you look at it. And if I handed you a seed, you wouldn't know if it's there. So you have to kind of ask and dig a little bit in normal circumstances to find out what those things are for the species that you're trying to save seeds from. And, I, and what I suggest is that everybody pick the plant, they, the garden vegetable or whatever it is that they love most, that they're most inspired by and learn how to save it first. Just take one and go through this and learn all these terms. So what does open pollinated mean? Well, it basically means that we're not going to control any, any pollination. It's what nature does all the time anyway. And what it really means for a seed saver is that you can have two parents who grow next to each other and cross pollinate and, uh, and you save the seeds in the first generation from them. They look like the parents and you plant those first generation seeds and you get the second generation, the F2, and they look like the F1 and they look like the parents. Everything kind of looks the same. There's always changes, you know, there's adaptations as I've been saying that happen every year. And there are minor changes that can happen. There's all sorts of stuff we go into in the genetics section of our seed schools. But um, uh, suffice it to say, open pollinate, plant it, save the seeds. It's really the easiest place to start for new seed savers. And a subset of open pollinate would be heirloom. But people are always asking, what does heirloom mean? Does it have to be 40 years old, Bill, or 50 years old to be an heirloom? I've got tired of all of those questions. So for me, an heirloom is a treasure. And you can create a treasure within two or three years. In your, as I said, if you start dehybridizing something, that's your treasure, baby. That's your heirloom. That's your heirloom for the future. As long as you're heading toward open pollinated, you can give the seeds to somebody and they don't have to worry about saving them. Man, you're on the heirloom train. And that's, those, that's 250 different tomatoes. And they're all different because they were all grown in different places. This just shows you how spread out the diversity and show you what you can do to your own tomato. All of that's locked into each one that you save seeds from.
And another subset, and we're hearing this more and more, especially with grains, is land race. Locally adapted, genetically diverse, promiscuously pollinating food crop, intimately connected to the land, ecosystem, farmer, and community. These were the priceless gifts given to us by, um, by our ancestors. 10,000 years of saving seeds from wild plants, largely things that we wouldn't eat now and turning it into the food crops of the day. Thinking about this, no Mendel, no genetics, nobody knew what plant breeding was. They just saved seeds from what they wanted and they created these beautiful land race varieties. And that's what we're going back to. That's what we're trying to find and keep alive. And land races, I would say applies to vegetables like black seeded Simpson, which is in a 200 year old uh, article in France. Um, uh, I could, I'm trying to think of the seed company that had it. Um, you know, black seeded Simpson is in most of our seed catalogs today. It's been around for a long time, tried and tested. Um, buy some seeds, buy black seeded Simpson from a lot of places, bring it to your house, seed the seeds and start to adapt it to where you are. That's what a land race gives you the chance of doing. And if you want, now we have a godfather for land race gardening. And if you just want to go blow your mind about the wealth and the diversity and the fun, and the spiritual nature of what's going on when you when you kind of switch over and see the power in these land races, then I highly recommend uh, Joseph's book. And I've got an hour long interview with him on the RockyMountainSeeds.org uh, website, and we sell his book. We actually sell a PDF of it um, for seven ninety five that you can download. All right, so then I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about hybrids because that's really. Um, where I think the juice is and where there's a lot of misunderstandings. So modern um, definition of hybrid is that um, it's two inbred parents that are crossed, that are intentionally crossed. Okay, hybrid in, in botany means, uh oh, anything that crosses anywhere and it creates something new. And so don't get confused with that um, definition. What we're talking about is the modern hybrid, okay? And so what happens is you take inbred parents, and these, this is the flower that Mendel worked with. That's why I like this. Turns out peas have two flower colors. So he would cross uh, a purple one and a white one. And uh, in the next generation, when he got the seeds, he would plant those, he'd get all purple flowers. Every time, all purple. All right, and then he would save seeds from that generation and plant them again, and he would get one third of the one out of three of the plants that he got um, would be white. And he's going, what? It disappeared for a whole generation. There were no white ones showing. And actually he invented the whole field of genetics trying to explain that. Where, what's going on underneath this? That, that, that the white flower originally can disappear for a generation and then come back at this three to one ratio. What's going on here? Well, if you look underneath, he invented this system and Panette, one of the people that actually helped validate Mendel after Mendel was dead, uh, came up with this uh, little square thing to show just mathematically all the possible combinations of the big bees and the little bees. Big bees mean dominant, little bees mean recessive, right? And what we learned from uh, uh, genetics, if you remember it all from biology, is that you have to have two recessives in order for a uh, recessive trait to express itself. So there's the picture of your big bees with your inbred parents. And by inbred, it means you, they're both the same. At both locations, you have the same uh, expression. So there's two big bees and two little bees. Therefore, you got a purple and a white. You cross those. Look at all the combinations that come, come up. At every combination, it's going to be a big bee and a little bee. And because there's only one little bee, guess what? Dominant expresses, you get all purple flowers. That's an explanation of genetics in about 60 seconds. So what happens next? If you take that F1 generation, which is a big B and a little B, and you cross it with another one in that F1 generation, a big B and a little B, and you cross those, what are the combinations you can come up with? Well, you get purple at three of the locations and two little whites, at one location. Oh my God, it's the three to one ratio. That's where that comes from. So this is what happens with hybrids. This is why industrial agriculture loves 
hybrid so much? Why they become so popular? Because in that F1 generation, and this is the seed they're selling you, you can predict at every location what's going to happen. If you set your parents up right, if you inbred them right and cross them, you can, you can have uniformity. And, and big ag needs uniformity. We don't need it. We can eat whatever grows in our gardens, right? We want diversity. We're, we're diversity creators now, but big ag needs it. And that's why this myth of you can't save seeds from hybrids. It'd be stupid for a farmer um, on a large scale to save seeds from his hybrids and plant them again and know that a third or more of his crop wasn't going to have one of the characteristics that he needed to sell it, right? What if he got a kale instead of kale? You know, yeah, this is not good. And so um, this is where we as small home gardeners are going to uh, take advantage of this and unlock hybrids and make sure everything's okay. And so, and as I said before, if you save seeds from the F2 and, and plant it, in the F3, you'll get more of what you're looking for. In the F4 generation, you'll even get more of them. And if you just keep saving seeds with the characteristics you want by the eighth generation, you should be good to go with something that I would sell in a small seed company like I owned for 28 years. And um, we'll have uh, uh, room for questions about hybrids at the end of this. So basic uh, uh, biology, if you wanna be a, a seed saver, perfect flowers. We don't say male and female flowers anymore. We, sell we say pollen producing and pollen receiving flowers. And if both those are in the same place on the same flower, then you have a perfect flower. If you have pollen producing flowers only and pollen receiving flowers only in different places on a plant or on different plants, then you have imperfect flowers. And that's what happens with corn, all right? The tassels are the females. I mean, the silks are the females and the tassels are the male flowers. So just remember that because as you get into seed saving and, and we talk about breeding a little bit, knowing the difference between perfect flowers and imperfect becomes important. And then last but not least, selfers and crossers. Selfers is just a, a friendly seed saving way of saying, oh, they mostly or largely self-pollinate. So that's a tomato flower. And this is the, um, uh, anther cone sticking out to the right there. And the anthers that contain the pollen are in the inside of that cone. And the, the pollen receiving part of that flower, the stigma and style is inside that cone. And before it can even poke its way out into the world to get pollen from somewhere else, it's pollinated with its own pollen, self-pollinated, designed this way. We've actually selected them to be this way. And so, and they've worked out their genetics a million years ago that they're fine. There's hardly any inbreeding depression in these things. They just found an environment for a million years and settled down and just like it worked for them. Largely understory in uh, Central American, Northern um, South American jungles. Okay. And this is contrasted to crossers. Crossers are um, uh, flowers that need to get pollen from somewhere else. This is a cabbage flower. It has both pollen receiving and pollen producing parts in the flower. So it's a perfect flower and yet it needs pollen from somewhere else. And this is done genetically inside it's self incompatible. And so never say never, you know, sometimes selfers cross, sometimes cross herself, you know, there's all this sort of gray area in botany, but generally that's the case that they need their pollen from somewhere else. So when, if you're a seed, saver, you're going to have to set up another plant or other places for them to get their pollen in order to be successful. And that's why this is interesting and, and what you, why you have to pay attention to it. And also the other side of that is with selfers, you don't have to worry about crossing by and large. And so the five beginning vegetables to save seeds from, and I'll go through these again, but they are tomatoes like this one, peppers, peas and beans, and lettuce. Those are largely self-pollinating crops. Therefore, you don't have to worry if you just want to become a beginning seed saver and save seeds from what you like. It's just an easy way to get into it. And because we don't have time to talk about breeding and how to set all this up and how to use these terms enough today,
um, you can go to uh, the seedalliance.org. They, this is probably the best thing I've ever read on, on breeding um, uh, vegetables for um, your own use. The language in here is complete and elegant. And uh, Michaela Cauley and uh, uh, Mr. Zydro um, did a phenomenal job of this. And this is free, you can download it. They've gone on to do uh, breakouts from this. So once you read the overall and you kind of want to learn how to do your own breeding, you could um, get one of this, we'll double click on say tomatoes and they've got them for peppers and cucumbers and squash and a number of other things. So this is really the complete information that you could do. This would be all you would need to become a world-class breeder. I highly recommend Carol Depe's book, uh, Harvard uh, geneticist for 25 years, moved home to Oregon, uh, backyard gardener. Um, she's not saying save your own backyard garden vegetable seed. She's saying breed your own varieties. And this book will uh, teach you her secrets and, and just to be infected with her approach, I think is worth it. And then Rowan White was actually one of the authors on this is one of my favorites because they got into an idea called recipes. You can, you can kind of know where you want to go or what you're trying to produce. You know, Carol Depe wanted a purple potted snap pea that was pole that was up so she didn't have to bend over and there weren't any on the market. So she knew where she wanted to go. And there's lots of different ways to get there with crossing things or saving things or whatever. Well, those are recipes is what Roland White calls them in here. And so she picked out a number of really great plant breeders that gave you their recipes. And what that does is get you up and running on the creativity. This is art people. This is like getting out of canvas and painting the picture your way. And there's lots of different ways to get there. And so this is one of my favorite books. You can get this through, uh, there's links to this on our website, rockymountainseeds.org. We've got a recommended books section. So how are we gonna get there? You know what, we need diversity. Uh, industrial ag is still dominating, at least on the world level. Um, they've saved all this diversity because they too are scared. Nobody's got any money, you know, to save the 7.4 million varieties they've saved. So we're left to our own. You know, now it's been two generations. Oh my God. And I, I think I'm going to make a mistake if I save my own seeds. What are we going to do? You know? And so I just like to throw in here this is a slide from a TED talk I gave about, well, we're going to use technology, people. We're going to use the most powerful technology there is to save ourselves. And it's not the phone, it's the seed. Inside each seed is a million more seeds. It's a perfectly replicating system, right? The cell phone is just a cell phone. You couldn't even put that in a clay jar for six months and have it work because the operating system wouldn't work. And you can put that seed in a clay jar for 600 years and it will work. All right. And not only is it self perfectly self-replicating, it has AI. It has artificial intelligence on each iteration through its life. It can take information from its immediate environment and encode that into its DNA by rolling it up. We know that now with epigenetics and then pass that on to its immediate offspring. We don't have any technology that elegant. If you think about it, you can have a handful of seeds, go anywhere in the world and start a whole new agriculture. And that's what we need to do to feed 10 billion people, in my humble opinion. We just need to reacquaint them with the excitement of seed saving. And you can do that in your own yard. And agriculture is filled with unbelievable stories of one guy or one family in their own backyard over their lifetime, creating varieties by just saving what they liked. Varieties like um, Reed's Dent Corn, which was the largest selling open pollinated corn in the world in the 20th century came from one guy in Illinois just saving his own corn seed. I mean, these things weren't created in laboratories and they weren't created in corporations. They were done with people the old fashioned way. And we all have that power if we'll just remember it. And we just have to get over this idea of scale that's keeping us from operational. We need uniformity. We need complicated seed um, rules. We need universities that know how to do this stuff. If Industrial agriculture at large scale is your goal, if that's what you need. And we probably need some of that now because that's what feeds us. But let's never forget that the smaller the scale, the more diversity 
we can tolerate, we can utilize, we can create, or as Joseph Lofthaus does, we can even dance around, all right? So there's a difference. There's green on the left. There's me hugging my green every morning in my front yard. If you don't have green to hug, you have not gardened, trust me. And it is the most, you know, right in front of me is purple Tibetan barley. That's a thousand year old var barley variety. Just to the left of it, two rows to the left is Harani, which, uh, uh, Durham wheat, which was mentioned by Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. All right, we're talking about stories and fun and life on a level that you've never seen before. So never forget what uh, Carol Depe says for us to do this. Um, selection is our most powerful breeding technique. Make no mistake, you are a plant breeder. If you just let one of your plants go to seed and it falls on the ground and you let that um, uh, volunteer grow the next year, you are an excellent seed saver. You are using selection. It has selected itself and you were smart enough to let it do that. That's selection, and it is the most powerful breeding technique. And don't take my word for it if you don't want to. Dr. John Navazio, uh, Johnny Selected Seeds, one of their lead breeders and a personal friend who's come to teach with us at Seed School, Dr. Carol Depe, bless her heart, unbelievable gardener and breeder. Joseph Lofthaus is on there. And then if you really want to get into to it, the guy that started so many people thinking about this, Dr. Raul Robinson, wrote the Return to Resistance on how to even save our industrial crops by um, learning how to select again in mass uh, quantities. And that is free as a PDF. It's out of print, but I found a PDF. You can um, click and download it from our recommended books section at uh, RockyMountainSeeds.org. Okay, Dr. Bill Tracy, he's one of the last uh, public plant breeders left in our great land grant universities that were largely set up to do public plant breeding. And they've all gone off on the GMO thing. You know, University of Arizona, that's the only kind of plant breeding you can study now is genetic engineering. You know, it's really sad, but some of the guys have held out and Dr. Bill Tracy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. If you want to study, get your PhD in plant breeding, that's where you have to go. You go there, you go to Oregon State or you go to Cornell. There's three people doing it that I know of on a real large scale. And so, you know, if we think agriculture, it started 10,000 years ago. What Bill Tracy says is, well, well, the first 9,850 years of plant breeding might not have been as efficient in modern terms, in other words, they can't do it as fast. It was highly effective. It created all the food we have. And it did it with millions of plant breeders, breeding for local adaptation in every environment for every food crop. And the goals were being set by millions of people. Now we have the opposite. We've got a handful of plant breeders at corporations for very few adaptations, the ones that are most profitable those are the only environment. And if the environment doesn't work, we just put chemicals on it to make it work, right? We only breed for about a half a dozen food crops, almost all the energy in breeding in this country. And only a handful of laboratory guys set the breeding goals if they're not set in boardrooms for corporations. And so we've got to get this back. You know, we've got to go back the two generations and do this. So just to summarize, for all of you, if you want to become a beginning, successful beginning seed saver and you want it to be easy, pick your crop. And if, and if you can, pick it out of one of these. You know, start with an annual self-pollinating crop. That way you'll get seeds first year. You know, you get them every year. You don't have to wait for two years like the biennials. And uh, you don't, largely you don't have to worry about crossing. Look at that, wheat, rice, oats, and barley. Don't cross or hardly cross. It's just this unbelievable playground that we have to, and tomatoes and peppers are our favorite things. So this is where you want to start. Or if you know other gardeners, see, I'm expecting all of you guys to go out and teach this stuff now. We need a million seed savers. I'm not going to teach enough people to do that. You got to help now. And at Rocky Mountain Seeds, we do seed um, school teacher trainings um, from time to time. So if you want to, you know, really up your game, just get around other people that want to teach this stuff. They're way better than I am actually. And so I'm just for a couple of minutes, I'm going to go through, and again, you'll have this PowerPoint, you'll be able to have all these pictures, you'll be able to figure this stuff out. This is how you do tomatoes or wet crops, cut them at the equator, squeeze out all the stuff into a jar, 
Let it set for three to five days. Wait for the white mold to form on top and then water winnow them. All the good seeds will soak to sink to the bottom. All the phlegm and all the garbage will flow to the top. Fill up your jar, your bucket, whatever you've got with water and, and it'll get kind of clear and just pour off all the stuff that's not seeds at the bottom. Then fill up your jar again. Let it settle and pour all that stuff off again. Fill it up with water. Let the seeds settle. Pour it off again. By the third time, you'll have good seeds. Peppers are easy. Just open them up and get the seeds. If you really can afford to, let them dry out first and you'll get that golden pepper seed color. This is what Steve Peters, who was head of seed production at, at, uh, at a great seed company for 20 years, told me this is what you want to look for is, uh, is that golden pepper seed color. He was at seeds of change. You know, beans, easy. Just get the beans. Let them dry out. If you wait too long, they'll dehist. That the, Their little pod will shatter and they'll all be gone. So you want to get them just before that and pull them in or pull the whole plants, let them dry upside down, and then all the beans can fall on a tarp or something. That's one way we've done it. At Native Seed Search, we used to thresh them. Uh, and we did that with bluegrass music. We got everybody involved. We would just stomp on them on a tarp. And then we would uh, rake off all the other stuff and, and get the beans if we could. Peas, same way. You know, I mean, this stuff is really complicated, people. <laughs> really, really complicated. And lettuce, wow. Lettuce. How, how do you get lettuce seed? You know, for my whole life. I was growing lettuce and I was so disappointed. I go out into my yard and I would see my lettuce and the, oh no, it's bolting. It was going to seed, right? And what are, and I was always disappointed because it gets bitter. You can't eat it anymore. You have to, and I didn't plant any 10 days ago. And, you know, no. Now I go out and see it bolting and I go, all right, seeds. And it grows up into these yellow flowers. And then those turn into the white little parachutes. And those are the seeds, right? They come in little 10 packs. It's really an elegant system. So what a whole greenhouse. This is Butler Crunch, by the way. I visited this greenhouse in, in uh, Colorado and they, they had it filled with this. And I go, Butler Crunch? Never seen, I go, Butter Crunch? What's Butler Crunch? And they said, oh, you don't know the Butlers? They live up at 8,000 feet on the West Slope. Um, they've been saving their own Butter Crunch for about six years and, and, and their name are the Butlers. And so they're saving their own seats. So they call it Butler Crunch now. I go right on, man. This is what we're doing. <laughs> that's what we all need to do. So that's the end of part two. And I'm willing to take a few questions again. And you're welcome to go take a break for a few minutes and come back. And I'll sit here. I'm doing pretty well. So I've got my tea. So if anybody has questions, you're welcome to ask questions. You can ask them about the first section or the second. Um, and we'll be able to take questions about all of this next week if you've had time to think about it and then they start to evolve. I have sort of a, a different question about the beans and peas. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure, like if you let them dry, is that sort of just like you could cook them down later as well as yes. kind of the next year, either way, save them? Okay. One of my favorite stories, I was at the Native Seed Search store in Tucson, which is one of my favorite places. In fact, I'm going to Tucson in a couple of weeks. That's where I'm going because they have so many different kinds of um, beans for sale. And so a woman um, came up to the, I was there one day and it came up to the cash register with a pound of yellow woman Indian beans. I say, I don't even know if it's proper to say that anymore or, and who named them that, but that was their name at the time. There's a beautiful yellow bean and she had a pound of them and we sold them so you could take them home and cook them and eat them. And then while she's there, she got to think, she goes, do you guys have any seeds for these? <laughs> and we all started laughing because she was buying a pound of seeds, right? You could, it goes either way. You know, we forget, we've been so compartmentalized as consumers and modern people that we've forgotten that. The beans are the seeds, are the beans, are the seeds. So that's all you really have to do. And so if you see a bean somewhere in a store or a market, anywhere in the world that are being sold to eat, and you want them, you can bring those home and bring home some of that diversity. Bill, I have a question. How long does it take 
a plant, if you're going to collect the seeds from it, to its adapt to for that plant to adapt to your area because Prescott is challenging at best on some, you know, growing issues. So I was just wondering, I, I started growing cilantro from a Verde person at a seed exchange and it came out to be the best seed. I have no idea when they started collecting it and right. making it available on the seed exchange, but I'm just wondering, like if I collected something here, how many years would it take for that seed to become completely adapted to the Prescott environment? Right. So completely adapted. I, nobody knows because we're just doing this. Nobody's ever really tried to bring all these land races back and pay attention to it for a couple of generations. So there may have been people around grandparents, great grandparents that would be able to answer that better. But I can tell you this, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at Prescott public library here because of the seed library. This is why seed libraries are so important. Why seed exchanges are so important because you can get stuff that is better than you can get anywhere in the world. You don't know where that stuff's coming from. And so you can get a head start on what's going on. And I don't, you know, we're starting to see stuff in, um, you know, I, buy, I get a lot of seeds here from Thunderfoot, who's a young man who's been doing it for 20 years here growing and saving seeds and making them available in the health food store and he's around and he's at farmers markets you know he doesn't want to be a seed company he doesn't want to sell them over the internet or whatever and so that's been a huge resource for me um and and then i just learned something the other day and this is i'm going to finally answer your question you know the guy that wrote the book on this now land race uh, gardening who's been doing it for um his whole life in some ways um, and as a multi-generational seed saver, Joseph Lofthouse's um, uh, grandfather uh, created the most successful variety of wheat, Lofthouse wheat that was grown in, in southern Idaho and northern Utah in the 1920s. Everybody grew Lofthouse. And so it's been in his family for a long time. And he's the one that's been doing these really great Grexes where he's mixing everything and starting to save the seeds again to see if he, because he wants adaptation and he wants flavor. So he doesn't, he's abandoned every other parameter for saving seeds. Doesn't care what it looks like or whatever. If it works in his soil and comes up and he can get seed and he saves it and it tastes good, that's what he's saving for. And his magic number now is three years. He's starting to see profound, he goes bing, 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 bing. By the third year, it's starting to pay off. But, you know, you get a payoff again and things adapt even more in the fourth year. But he said, you hang in there for three years and you'll start to see real change. So I'll just tell you that. that I just learned that from the seed school we did this summer with him in Mancus, Colorado. All right. That's so, good to know. Yeah. Look yes. as much as you can for stuff that's already been saved in your area or a similar, you know, Prescott, you know, you could get stuff from Flagstaff, colder, you know. If you're going for tomatoes and you want cold tolerance, that kind of stuff. Same latitude, mm -hmm. same elevation around the world is what uh, I'm trying to think of. There's a gentleman who wrote a really um, beautiful book called Beautiful Corn who did that. He lived in Portland and he went all the way around the planet at his latitude at that elevation to find varieties of things that would work for him in Portland. That was his way of hacking into that. So. I'll be quiet now. You have more to say. Well, the only thing I was going to say is that I've been in this area for 10 years and, and gardening for nine after I established my garden. This past year has been extremely challenging. I've bought seeds from the same company um, over a number of years. And this past year I had like, I would say zero to 30% germination. And that's kind of frightening. You, you wonder about, you know, what caused this? And so I'm looking into obviously collecting seeds and saving them and trying to get them acclimated to our area. So it is a concern. Bless you. It's the most valuable thing. You know, we've got three days of food in our supermarkets. And if um, uh, I-17 gets washed out and, you know, if the um, Agua Fria flows over I-17 down there in yeah. any of a number of places. Um, Prescott's um, uh, shelves, food shelves are empty. And I'm not saying this to scare anybody, but this has happened. 
and is happening all over the world and in parts of the United States. In fact, they said 85% of the people in the United States were affected by a billion dollar storm last year because of climate change, 85% in some ways. So we're not talking about that. So what happens if the stores are empty? You know, people freak out. And that's what will get us. I did survival training. It's not the, your actual survival. We can make it for days without water, weeks without food. You know, we're pretty resilient creatures. That's not what's going to get us. What will get us is freaking out and overreacting to things. And so I like to think that there'll be a few of us that walk into the middle of town when everybody's freaking out and they got their guns out or whatever they're going to do. <laughs> I don't know. And with a few handfuls of seeds and go, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Calm down, everybody. We got seeds. It only takes us, you know, a few months. We can scale up. There's, you know, inside this PC, there's about 16,000 of them in the first generation. You know, there's abundance all over. Let's just, let's divide up. Let's use our energy. Let's figure out how we're going to do this. And that's sort of my strategy. That's what lets me sleep at night is that the seed savers that are bringing diversity in the seed libraries and the seed exchanges back into our little towns, even though it's just a bloody mess of stuff, and most of us don't know what we're doing, it's still the most important thing we could do, because we will figure it out, especially if we have to. Yeah, one of the reasons why I pursued growing lettuce throughout the winter is because of all the sicknesses that people have experienced on the commercial lettuce um, yeah, there you with go. E. coli and whatnot. And I know exactly what's in my ground and I know exactly how it's watered. So I don't need to concern myself with that. So, well, they let us, it's you know, challenging they built, here. They build a six story building in downtown Jackson Hole, Wyoming, that's run with, all with disabled people that uh, vertically grows enough lettuce for all the restaurants downtown there now. Wow under lights and using a south window, you know. I mean, we, all the technologies there. All we have to do is just organize ourselves a little bit differently and keep those dollars in our, in our communities and, and serve better food. It's healthier, we know that too. And guess what? If the apocalypse never comes and we just live our lives out with, on this technological loop and everything stays fine, um, great, we still have better food and we get to know each other, you know, and we have better stories, so. It's all good in some ways. I, I, you know, it's got upsides on every, all sides of it. So, thanks. Good talking to you. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go into, you know. So I've been teaching courses for about 40 years, and um, the number one question is, um, you know, how do you store your seeds? So I'm going to go into that a little bit. I'm trying to, you know, this is. I feel like <laughs> what we're doing in some ways is what they had to do in World War II with airline pilots. You know, it takes you about a year to go through all your courses and all your practice and all your time to become an airline pilot. And in World War II, they shrunk that down to about four days and got people up in the air to go on bombing raids, right? And so that's kind of what we're doing here. So all this stuff, as I keep mentioning, will be there and the references and we're here. Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance is just an alliance of people that want to put themselves out of business. And we're going to do that when everybody has their own seeds everywhere in our region. That's our goal, right? All the seeds for the Rocky Mountain West, clear down to the Mexican border from the Rocky Mountain West. That's really all we're doing. And so, and you can go to our website. We have directories for seed stewards. You can pull up all the other people that are part of what we're doing. You can click on them. You can communicate with them directly. You can share seeds. You can see what they're growing. I think we've got like 285 people now that have dedicated themselves to growing, saving, and sharing the seeds to at least one thing. And you can be part of that network. So don't feel alone or overworked here today or like it's too much going over your head because it, well, I'm just introducing this here to you so that you can uh, get started and hopefully get excited. So um, of all the parts of seed saving where I can't teach you how to be really great, it's in the actual harvest and cleaning of seeds. Um, it's a craft. And that's why Seed to Seed, um, Suzanne Ashworth's book was originally put together. They, they got the craft success suggestions from 10 years of the uh, Seed Savers Exchange, which, was which is now the world's largest seed exchange, right? And they put all the little tricks everybody had learned. And that's what it is, it's all the little tricks. And so that's been updated recently uh, in this book, The Seed Garden. 
And so all of Susan's are in there and then then um, they brought it into the modern world and there's a lot more in this one. So I've got both these books and I love them. And then if you wanna scale up and do it on a larger scale, which is what we might have to do in Prescott and in Cottonwood and in Cornville, is that if we really are cut off with food and seeds, then we're gonna have to scale up our productions. We're gonna have to learn how to be good seed savers and learn uniformity, um, but we'll have the diversity to do that. Then uh, John Navazio's book is the one that teaches you how to do that. This is from a lifetime of doing seed um, production at scale. All right, so words that, you, that you'll run into that I want you to understand and you may already know, thresh. It just means to stop or beat the plant matter, to separate the seed from the chaff. And this has been done you know, since the dawn of agriculture in lots of kinds of different ways. All right. Another word I want you to understand is scalp. Scalp happens, it's a modern, more of a modern term, but it happens when we have screens and seeds and we're trying to screen it. So a scalp means that you have a screen that is too small for, no, excuse me, that's big enough for the seeds to fall through. So what it does is it catches all the big matter that's around, all the chaff that's bigger than the seeds is caught and the seeds fall through. And sifting then happens with seeds that have um, holes that are so small that the seeds won't fall through and all of the fine matter falls through. And so by scalping and sifting, you can find that you can get your seeds quite clean, not perfectly clean, but quite clean. And I always scalp and sift first when I get my seeds in out of the field say off that tarp that we were threshing beans on um, before I go on to the next stage, which is winnowing or blowing. And again, this is just time honored. Here's the Taos Pueblo. They even make baskets, winnowing baskets to do this. And you go out with the breeze and it will blow the chaff to the side and all your clean seed would fall because it's heavier, fall straight through. There are techniques where you can do this in a basket by shaking it back and forth. We saw this done at one of our seed schools in Colorado. It made me cry. They were, I think there were Somali women doing it. And they did it with such rhythm. And so you could tell that it was multi-generational. I'll never be able to, <laughs> to win on my seeds as elegantly or as beautifully in a dance as they do. But I'm getting, you know, this is the craft. I'm getting started. I know how to do it, you know. And here's a famous painting even where it's being done. So, you know, Casey O'Leary, who started Snake River Seed Co-op, she, she uses double box fans to do it. She likes the wind flow that comes through there and then she will pour lettuce seed through the fans and it will blow the chaff off and the good seed will be in the first one. Then the a little bit lighter, but not quite as good seed will be in the second one and then all the chaff will blow out onto the tarps. So that's really how you clean seeds. You know, if you buy a clipper seed cleaner, if you've got a, a thing going over there, maybe slow food, you know, Prescott will do this at some point. We just got one at Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. Um, basically, a modern seed cleaning machine scalps, then it sifts, and then it blows, <laughs> okay? It does the same time-honored things. It just puts them in there and does them automatically for you. Um, this is one we had at Native Seed Search. It was an old hand crank clipper. Same company's been building them for more than 100 years. And I really like this one because I could... Uh, uh, I, if I cranked higher, I could get more blow. You know, I could kind of tune into what kind of blowing way I was getting. And if you get into seed cleaning, um, uh, having the right size screens is, you know, for what you're growing and doing is really important. And you can spend as much on a set of screens as you can on the machine itself. We just did that with our clipper. And something I discovered after, you know, 20 years of trying to write down numbers for myself, turns out screen sizes are done by the numbers. And so a 12 screen would mean there are 12 holes to the inch, both ways, all right, a 12 by 12. And if you'll go to the website there, the A.T. Farrell bought the clipper company, so you have to go to their site, you can find a free PDF to download that will show you the screen sizes you need for all of the major crops. And I, I never had to, I had to um, experiment to find this and I came up with my own list. I wish I'd known this one. So this can save you some steps. And um, you don't actually even need screens if you don't have any money. One of our uh, seed school students went down to the fabric store 
and made a whole set of screens using fabric. They didn't last as long, but they were very, very inexpensive. And you could get more sizes for less money. Um, and if you want your own set of seed cleaning screens, you can go to that website, southernexposure.com and buy the screens. Um, I think they even sell the, the wooden um, uh, frames around them. I made my own frames. Um, I had a set of six screens. They're, they sell five. I had a set of six that I ran my seed company for 28 years with. I never needed a seed cleaning machine. You can do a tremendous amount of seeds if you get it and get to practicing you know, each of the ways of doing it and learn this craft. And the more you do it, the better you get. And this is one of the things I look for now. This is why seed exchanges are so great or a big a potluck dinner at the end of the year where everybody comes together and cleans and, and exchanges a seed and you get to see techniques and people can tell you how to do things. We can up our communities really quickly in this kind of stuff. And then, you know, one of the questions that always comes up is how long, Bill, how long can I save my seeds? And if you ask that question on the internet, this chart will come up, some version of it. I did that. It's, uh, it came up on Seed, ex uh, seed Savers Exchange, that there was a, a seed longevity chart. So I clicked on it. It actually took me to Fedco Seeds. I don't know why. They don't have their own, but they, it took me over there and I got it. And I've been seeing this chart for 40 years, some version of it. And it's always bothered me because it's not right. It's not very accurate. It's accurate in that it gives you relative terms. In other words, onion seeds do probably go bad faster than tomato seeds, which are five to 10 years on this chart. And I can just tell you from my own experience, we routinely, routinely got 90 plus germination on tomato seeds that were 10 years old. Okay. So they don't last five to 10 years. They last 10 to 20 to 30. On my life, I've got some tomato seeds. I just started some tomatoes, some 1990 such as all ties I grew in my yard this year. So what is that? 30 years, they, all, they were fine. I got about 85% term, I think. So, so where did this come from? Where did this chart come from? Who did this? Where's the data? We're data heads now. We, I want the double blind study or whatever you know, equivalent. I want the college paper. Who grew out everything every year for 10 years and then marked down this chart? And I can tell you, you can't find it. I've been, I challenged people for 40 years to give me a copy of the original of where this came from. And nobody's ever been able to do that. This is folk wisdom that's been passed around and around and around. And for experienced seed savers, they see this and they go, it doesn't make any sense. I have onion seed that's 40 years old that I got about 60% germination out of. So what good is it to tell people that the onion seed isn't going to last a year? There's just, it's just not good. So finally, I found it about a year ago. This was published in the Southern Gardener in 1838. And it makes sense now. This was in a very high, humid, hot climate where seeds don't last very long. And I think that this where some version of this chart got passed around the world and is still getting passed around without question. And each of us in each area probably need to do some version of this chart for our own seed savers. So I'm just giving you my background on this, all right? And so ultimately, how long do seeds last? Well, the answer is 2000 years. This is uh, Methuselah. There are the carbon dated date palm seeds. Um, this date palm had been extinct for a thousand years. We have it in the fossil records. Um, some Israelis planted the seeds they found in a tomb and um, they planted the embryos from the seeds. They had to help them a little, but they were still living, breathing embryos after 2000 years. And on the right-hand side of the picture is, are the dates that they just harvested first this year from that tree, this was in the New York Times, that picture. So think about that. Living, breathing entities that can skip over a thousand years of extinction and still bring us back their adaptive magic. As I said before, we don't have any technology that is that durable or that magical. We don't have self-replicating technologies. We don't have them with the artificial intelligence that these plants have. So
So the answer for how do I store my seeds? Cool, dark, and dry. All right, cool, dark, and dry. And clay pots are probably how we got most of the varieties of land races that we have after 10,000 years, because that's how they were stored. They, they co-evolved with a clay system in almost all cases. So that if we could return to clay, I think that would happen because it absorbs the moisture out and, and moderates things. And in Arizona, you don't have to worry about dry. We're in one of the driest climates there is. And so just if you're going to bag up your seeds, and I'll take any other questions about these, about whether to put them in a freezer or not or whatever. If you're going to um, um, store your seeds in any kind of glass or plastic, just don't do it on a rainy day, all right? And the dry part will be good for you. So the only other question is how cool? Well, Dr. Bruce Bugby at the Plant Sciences Department at Utah State University got a contract with NASA to study um, what it would be like to take seeds to Mars on a manned Mars mission. Because if we go to Mars, we're gonna have to wait for a bunch of months before you know, Mars comes back around and lines itself up for them to blast off to come back to Earth. Otherwise you're just wasting fuel. Mars is coming back around and, and coming close to us again. So, so um, what does it cost? to take seeds to Mars, how many can we take and what do, how do we have to store them? And so he did that kind of testing with um, seeds at different temperatures to see when they start to die. And generally seeds are okay. Their die off curve, some die every year, but like, as, like I said, only 10% die after 10 years in tomatoes. That's a pretty shallow curve. This curve for seed survival drops off steeply if seeds are above 80 degrees for a length of time. That's what he found out. So that's what he said to NASA. Just keep them below 80 degrees, you'll be fine. That's how durable they are, all right? So don't put them in your car window and cook them. You know, in most of our homes, they'll be fine. You know, there's nothing real special. If you wanna be special, find some clay to put them in, I would say. If you wanna put them in your freezer, put them in plastic bags or paper bags and mark them all and get them all ready and then put all of that in a glass jar and and screw the lid on tight on a day that's not rainy and i do that because plastic's permeable to moisture in a freezer we've all gone you know i grew up with elk in the freezer and you know you can't even see it after a year because all the frost that's in there with it right so that doesn't work with seeds so Put them in a glass jar. And then when you take that glass jar out, be careful to let it warm up to room temperature before you open it. Otherwise, you open up a frozen jar and all the moist air in your kitchen goes in there and it condenses on the inside of your jar and your seeds then aren't dry anymore. So those are that's just a simple thing. And more and more, I just store my seeds. I mean, perfect for seeds would be root cellars. We know we have numerous stories in the Southwest of seeds lasting for hundreds, if not 600 years in clay jars, just in the north side of cliff dwellings. So, so it doesn't, we don't have to overthink this. And I just going to um, kind of close out with something that Joy Houch, she was um, uh, someone that we actually hired at Native Seed Search and went on to be a director there for a while. And she said something that was so simple, but so profound to me. So next time you get your seeds, any seed for your garden, um, remember this, when choosing a cultivar, you are choosing an entire agricultural system. Okay. You can help us shift this whole thing back to sustainable and resilient and joyful and abundant with our own local seed saving. If you will choose your cultivars carefully, all right. There's no, you know, um, but if you see something out of the industrial system that you really love, bring that home too. You know, that, we need diversity. As I said, that's what start. I'll end with that. We need more diversity. So I'm all for anybody bringing anything from anywhere into Prescott or to Cottonwood or to Cornville and trying to grow it and, and, and seeing um, if it'll work here and adapting it to here because we need as much diversity as we can get at this point. And let's just say, we get to be the pioneers. We get to make all the mistakes. Every, you know, if you bring home 50 different varieties of something and 49 of them die and it's the worst disaster you've ever had in your life, but one of them makes it and gives you seed, bingo. 
That's what we're looking for. So every disaster we have from now on and is now our greatest gift as seed savers. And we can go on and do this. So I'll take questions. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. I know Vicki had a two-part question um, regarding pole beans and tomatoes. Vicki, you're welcome to unmute and ask yourself, oh, or I can read it for you. I'll just get to it right now. So her question was, she saved some pole beans for seeds because they were a little too tough to eat, kind of stringy. She dried them, but are these okay to use in following years to grow, but harvest sooner or what would you recommend? Well, I would definitely grow them. I mean, what it comes down to, yeah, I mean, there are nuances. Are they good? Do you like them? Do you like this variety of pole bean? If not, um, plant, you know, what I'm, I'll tell you what I'm planting next year is um, Joseph Lofthouse pole bean Grex. He's got about 75 different kinds of pole beans. And um, that's what he does is plant out 75 different kinds and uh, taste them all. See which one, which ones grow up to the height you like to pick them. He doesn't, doesn't want real high ones, doesn't want real low ones. He wants ones that are easy to pick. So go through and find the ones that are at your height, the ones that um, uh, actually ripen when you want them to, the one, taste them, see which ones you taste. And then when you go through all of that, those are real personal things. Bingo, save the seeds from those. I mean, the short answer is yes, save those seeds and they'll work and they've, they're adapted. And maybe those will end up being your favorite bean. Maybe they have a story. You know, maybe they're from your grandparents. I don't know. But um, yeah, when in doubt, save them <laughs> and grow them again. And if you can, then mix them in with a Grex of others or try something. I mean, that's really become what where I'm going with gardening now is that um, I'm going to try as many different kinds of things now as I can. I only have about six or eight good, you know, years to garden. I woke up the other day at age 67 going, man, how many more years can I get out there and do this? I mean, so I've got a pretty small sample space. So I'm just trying to accelerate the process. And by doing that, I'm going to try to um, sift through as much um, uh, diversity as I can and find my bean. I found my corn. I'm working on my corn. I've got a corn grex going for tortillas. And, uh, and I found a really great tomato that produces every year here. I wish it was a little sweeter. So maybe I'm going to plant with others and maybe it'll cross and I'll get something that tastes a little better. But um, I'm on my way, you know, and that's all you should see yourself as. You're kind of on your way in this process. And every year it will be frustrating. And every year it'll probably get better in some ways. And that's all we can do. Um, well, we have another question. This is about tomato seeds. So what's your experience with saving tomato seeds that haven't um got you know where you let it sit in the water and then the mold removes that that seed coat or I'm not sure what the term is but what's your experience with those being viable seeds if you haven't done that um they're all they're viable anyway tomato seeds you know I have uh, I bit into a tomato one time I was in New York City or somewhere and you know it was one of those oh my god tomato you know moments and um I uh, looked around and there was still uh, some of it on the plate and I found a couple of seeds and I uh, scraped them onto a napkin and I put it in my pocket and brought it home and grew it out. And um, so tomato seeds work, no, these are incredibly resilient and flexible systems. And so the reason why we go through the fermentation method is that that white mold that it's a bread mold actually on the top it's got penicillin and other antibiotics in it and it actually treats the seeds for known seed borne diseases if there happen to be any we happen to live in a climate where there's not a lot of those anyway but still it's and then the seeds clean up really nice it's really easy and elegant system once you get into it and you can still eat the tomatoes you know i just squeeze them out and then i dry the tomatoes so it works, it's all part of my deal, but you don't have to do that. And you can even, you know, green tomatoes. If you've got a green tomato, you can let it sit for a couple of weeks to finish ripening. That's the best thing to do. But I've even gotten seeds out of green tomatoes to work before. So never say never, never give up. Always be the seed saver. Trust in those little, you know, embryos that can last for 2000 years in a day palm. Man, those guys are intelligent beings and they're here to tell us something. I really, I think that more and more, 
They're here to teach us. And a follow-up question to that, what other seeds do you recommend doing the fermentation method on? Um, I was at Holler and Company, which is one of the only family-owned seed companies left. You know, there were 20,000 small seed companies around the world probably um, after World War II, and now six companies own 70% of the world's seeds. And almost every family-owned seed company in the United States was purchased by one person or another. I mean, even burpees is owned by George C. Ball Chemical Company. I mean, they're all, it's a mess out there. But one family company, there's a couple of them, stayed family. And Holler and Company in Colorado uh, do the QQ birds, the cucumbers and melons and squashes. And they're, they're experts in that. And when I ask them about that, the question, you don't have to do the wet method, they call it, with, with the QQ birds, but you can. And so I asked them what they did. And they said, you know, Bill, after doing it both ways, cost, complications, when we do a lot of them here, it all boils down to that disease resistance. For that, it's worth it. So they do it. So I would say cucumbers, watermelons especially are easy. And, and cantaloupes you can do that way. Um, you can do um, tomatillos that way also. Um, I've seen people do peppers that way. Although I don't do my peppers that way. I just fold them open and let them dry. Um, I'm trying to think if I've seen anything else done that way. For me, that's about it. Um. So Lori had a question. She's just looking for some tips on saving summer and winter squash seeds. Well, you know, the number one thing to uh, realize is that you, um, the time to pick a summer squash, especially, and even a winter squash to eat it is way, way different than the time that you would pick it for seed. You want it to what they call cure. And this goes for cucumbers also. And so um, you wanna leave them in the field as long as possible. In Prescott, that may not be possible, right? If you get an early frost or whatever. So in that case, you wanna pull up the whole vine, as much of the plant as you can and bring it in and hang it in a garage or in a pantry or something and let it fully ripen and cure, okay? And then um, it's just a matter of breaking it open. And I use ice cream scoops for summer squashes. And uh, usually my winter squashes are so big, I just use my hands and I'll scoop the seeds out. And that's where, you know, wet method, you know, sometimes it comes with so much goopy other stuff that it makes sense to put it in water for a day or so and let the seeds settle out just to clean them. Or what you can do is just immediately put the seeds out on uh, a tarp and let them dry. And then, um, and get rid of all the chaff once it's dry, you can winnow it out then that way. You'll still get that little papery cover on squash seeds sometimes, even after you've gone through that process. And that may not flake off till way later, but you can winnow that. And actually as a, a home gardener, we don't have to worry about that. You know, we've got this industrial um, and seed packet idea that we've got to have perfectly clean seeds. And when you're a home gardener, who cares, right? You're just, it's just compost. You're just going to put it back in the garden with all the rest of your stuff. So you can short circuit your cleaning for your seeds and just leave the dirt, the chaff, or, or in this case, that squash stuff in there and just grab a handful of that and plant it. It doesn't matter. This is Lori. I have um, some amazing seeds I bought online from Etsy. They're I have okay. problems with squash bugs. So these are climbing zucchinis. They're called trombosini zucchinis. Oh, these things are like three or four feet long and the seeds are in a bulb at the bottom, but okay. the entire three or four feet is edible. Wow. So I've had, I've got some of them, three of them uh, that at the end of season I left on the vine and the other two I brought in. So I didn't, wasn't sure like, is it, if the ones that I brought in, I'll keep letting dry or mature and then cut them open. And the other ones, I'm just going to keep on the vine outside as long as I can. Right. I, I just wasn't sure the best way to try to you know, harvest I, those seeds. So stop worrying. It all works. Okay. <laughs> you know, and what, you know, in the end, what Joseph Lofthouse would say, 
oh my God, I left my squash out so long that they froze and broke, you know? <laughs> and he would say, oh, now I'm selecting for frozen broken squash because I don't, have, I can't remember to, to harvest them on time. And so he, that would become part of his selection technique. And, you know, it, they'll probably work. I don't know. You know, it'll all work on some level. And so some may work better than other. And I want you to fill me in on what works. And I'd love to try some of these things. They You're amazing. amazing. Yeah. You know, you're bringing a treasure into Prescott. Just keep talking about them and share some seeds, you know. There's going to probably be some in the seed exchange at the library. Oh, great. There you go. See, listen to that, everybody. This is, and then see, the reason community, we're going to talk about this next week, community becomes another really important part of this whole thing. Because if you give away 25 or 30 people get seeds and they're all growing them, then instantly it's like I was saying in that F2 generation, there's 100 plants growing around Prescott. And then you can pull notes on what's happening and look for variations and, and to make sure that it's, you know, staying vibrant as a variety. And so, you know, together you can steward it. Whereas you might only have room for one or two plants where you are. Well, I'm looking at a picture of these trombone senos, and wow, I want to grow one too. It looks like it could Why be. Why don't I stop me. sharing? Can you share it? Um, I put it in the link, but I can share my screen as well. Let me stop my share here. There we go. Oh yeah. Yeah. Look at these, these are incredible. And, and that entire neck on that really long one that that guy's holding, that entire neck is like a seedless zucchini. And oh. those seeds are at the bulb at the bottom. Oh my God. See, what a gift. If you tried to breed one of those, it would take generations, probably. I mean, it's a wily genera and family, the QQ birds. Oh my God, there are so many mysteries still in that. And so anytime you see something like that, they're really gifts. It looks like those uh, alpine horns. I wonder if that's where they got the idea. <laughs> Lori, how, how big were yours? I might've missed what you said, but how long did yours get? Um, I didn't get any as long as that gentleman is holding, but I think the longest ones that I got were like four feet long. Wow, still almost. Oh <laughs> there you, there's the fundraiser for the library every year to have a con contest to see who has the longest one. <laughs> like the big pumpkin contest. Wow, I love that idea. Uh, we do have another question from Vicki. She was asking about pull, pull beans and I think she was saying, um, are they always stringy? No, there are stringless pull beans. That's the flavor part you know what i found is that, that doesn't bother me too much because some of my favorite beans um have kind of they have you know minor strings and i think there's been a lot of selection for that blue lake for instance but i still you know when i pull them off or pull the end off to get them ready to eat um the string will just pull off with it you know so it, it's not an overwhelmingly bad thing for me personally but yeah they're stringless right look for it Look all over for it. You know, that's what I would do then. I make that your quest so that, um, uh, you know, fine chefs everywhere will worship you. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Great questions. Are there any others? Does anybody want to unmute and ask a question? You know, this, the reason why we do this is that the most important questions you can ask are yours specific to your, they seem embarrassing to a group, right? But it's like the next little hump or the question you've always had lingering in your head about your particular thing that'll have no relevance to anybody else. But that's the most important question. So yeah, this is open for all the questions. You don't have to ask something that's uh, important for everybody. Just ask your question. Let's get down the road here. So I'm growing amaranth for the first time and 
uh, trying to tell when I should cut the seed heads off to collect, harvest the seeds. Yeah, I, you know, I've never cut them off. So what I do is um, I, I let the plant dry as much as I can and it starts to get bristly. Okay. In fact, many of the older varieties are so bristly, if you start rubbing it uh -huh. to get the seeds out, it'll cut your hands. Ooh, okay. So, you know, our, our good friend and seed steward, um, uh, Thumbs Heath, um, spent 20 years breeding um, varieties of amaranth that are soft, that don't cut your hands. So I was at his place. What he does is just leaves them as long as he can and then just yeah. bends over. Uh -huh. The plant and rubs on it until everything falls into a paper bag. Okay. All right. So that's what I would. Now, if you're getting snow and it's not quite ready, pull the whole plant and let it dry inside, like right. we do everything else. The energy from that plant will still go into the seeds. And that's why we do that if you have room. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to see if there was a way to test it so I wouldn't lose all the seed. You're going to lose some trying to collect so, it. Yeah, bending yeah. it over is why I do it. And then you get everything. And then, okay. you know, win, winnowing amaranth is a real, I saw <laughs> the Guatemalans doing that. And, and they were doing, we were doing popping amaranth. Have you ever seen popping amaranth? Mm -hmm. they've, they've been um, selecting their amaranth to pop like popcorn. Really? In a skillet. And so it fluffs up into this most delicious, incredible dish you've ever, oh wow. my God. <laughs> and so, but to get it clean enough with the, yeah. you know, the dirt, all the stuff that comes is really hard, but mm -hmm. practice, that's where you have to practice. Yeah. Thanks. And so if you have a selection or a number of seeds from something and you can't plant all of them or you're giving them away, like when you're choosing which seeds to plant, do you want just a variety again then, like for biodiversity, or do you want to choose the ones that are larger or, you know, like what's best indicators of health or I don't know what. Well, you know, you so Carol Depe, Dr. Depe um, would remind us, you know, that selection, thank you, you're thinking, what am I going to plant? You know, that's where we come into this. This is why we have an agriculture after 10,000 years. Humans can't help but do that. We're going in. And so you have to be careful about what you're selecting for because as Carol pointed out, maybe that if you just pick all the big seeds, you know, for something that you're not gonna eat the seeds of, you're just getting the big seeds because you think you're getting the, the biggest and best and most vibrant, that you may be inadvertently selecting something else out like earliness, you know, we just don't, there's so many connections and, and none of that's really been studied for things. I mean, if you're um, squ selecting squash seeds to eat, say silver edged squash, which is a variety that's been selected for, I don't know how long it goes back for eating the seeds, you know, they like pumpkin seeds you would eat, then of course you'd want bigger ones. But for the rest of it, I, you know, it's kind of hard. And that's where you have to start to develop your own sense. And that's why I brought up Joseph Lofthouse, who's saying, ah, the only thing I'm going to select for is flavor. I get as much diversity as I can. I throw it in there. And then, because I want to see what works and what I like to eat. And, you know, it's like uh, William Merwin said, when somebody asked him where to start in teaching his poetry, he was a great poet. He said, well... I would hope that someone would start with something with a poem they love. So that's the only other thing I would say for selection. Do stuff you love, that you really, truly love to do. Then all that other left lobe you know, stuff goes away. You're doing your best, you made it simple, and you love to do it. And then you'll be a great gardener. I just wanted to add, after meeting Joseph Lofthouse, he even <laughs> selects to for his squash to fit on his baking pan oh yeah that's right that's his other thing is that? it has to fit on the baking pan <laughs> <laughs> but that's important to him and you yeah know, they're like these the little mid-sized things yeah. and, I, and i think it was if i remember right renee it was because they were so hard to cut open he only saves ones that are easy to cut open and fit on his baking pan 
Now that's selection. <laughs> Good, I don't think we have any more questions, but we do have a few more minutes. So if anything else is burning, please ask. Bill's, Bill has over 30 years of experience of seed saving. He's a person to ask. How about eggplant? Um, eggplant is best um, put in a blender. If you want it, don't, you know, like I've got an old blender. I wouldn't do it in a new one. And I've heard of people that put a little piece of tape on the front cutting edge. So it's not as sharp before they do it. Uh, Cause they claim they could cut the seats, you know, apart. And I do this with tomatillo sometimes too, but if you'll just, um, you know, scoop out all, I, you can just throw the whole thing in there. If you're in a hurry, cut it up into chunks and put a whole eggplant in there. If you want, you know, of course, taste some of it um, and blend it into and put enough water or whatever into it to make it a, a slosh and work. You can then do the wet method with eggplant and it will, that's the easiest way that I've found. You can pick around in there and try to find all the seeds if you want to, but that's not what I've done. So that's good. And Bill, do you want eggplant to um, get a little more ripe? When you save the seeds? Oh yeah. Yeah. Let them go as, you know, it's all these things, but I've, you know, I've seen people that have done it when they're not, you know, at eating stage. So again, you know, it, uh, yeah, let them go. That system set up to nurture and to take care of those seeds. And so I would let that go as long as you can. I was just going to look here. I was wondering how long Prescott has had a seed library. So this is actually our first year of having a seed library. We just started it this past uh, January, I believe. That's what I thought I saw somewhere. So I think in the Master new. Gardeners, uh, somewhere I saw that. Um, who do I, who's running it? What do you mean? Who's running the program? It's a collaboration between Prescott Public Library, Prescott Gardener, and the, Master Gardeners? I'm not 100% positive. I know Prescott Gardener is a group that was um, kind of instrumental in starting it. Okay. And it's a woman who came in and was like, hey, I have these seeds. I have this great idea. Okay. And um, met with a bunch of community places, like went to the farmer's market and talked to people there. So I don't know. Sorry. I'm, I'm uh, the new coordinator for the Verde Valley Seed Library, and I thought it would be a great idea to connect with your seed library and exchange ideas. Oh, absolutely. You're more than welcome to. Um, if you want to email any one of us, we can connect you in with the right people. Ruthie Hewitt, um, my supervisor, is the one who's kind of our point of contact here at the library. Okay, uh, but great. you can send an email to just our Ask a Librarian email and we can make sure that you get in contact with her. Okay, thank you. That's such a good idea, Peggy. You know, that um, Rebecca Newburn was telling me she's part of, a, I think there's like 26 seed libraries in the East Bay of the Bay Area in San Francisco, oh, okay. you know? And to her library, Richmond's part of this association of 26 libraries. And then I think in November, I'm speaking at a convention for, I'm gonna do it through Zoom of the Michigan Seed Library Association. And they have 72 seed libraries now. Yeah. That's They're really cool. helping each other, you know? And that's what, wow, what a great idea. So yeah, you know, find out what works, you yeah, know. What, what doesn't, and then even exchange at some point, some of the best stuff. Yeah. And, or like Molly did, you know, we had that um, Meet You on the Hill, um, Slow Food Gathering. All the people that are over on the Verde Valley side, we all drove to the top of the Mingus and camped overnight. And she brought all the people up from Prescott. And we all met on the top of the hill and had a big potluck, local food potluck and seed exchange. It was great. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, just a reminder to the folks who are still here, there is the follow-up to this workshop going to be next week, Saturday, same time, same place. Um, you should 
register on our calendar if you haven't yet to make sure that you get the link. Um, thanks for all coming today and sticking us out, sticking out with us. Uh, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, everybody. It's been a real pleasure. I can't wait. So get your questions for next week. And thank you again, Bill. All right. Take care.